Well, as we said before, it is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is the reference to when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and the people, the disciples, were gathered around him. They were grabbing palms, laying them down, and he was on a donkey. He was fulfilling prophecy intentionally that was spoken of in Isaiah. And in our text this morning, the good news of that salvation is front and center, that the Lord does save. That's what Hosanna means. The Lord saves. The people gathered around Jesus and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Because they began to put two and two together and they re- began to realize this was the promised Messiah. Uh, the only trouble was, was that the ones who were the religious leaders, their pastors of their day, uh, had a different view of Jesus. and They were already plotting to kill him. And in about a span of a week, the people's shouts would shift from Hosanna to crucify him. Martin Lloyd-Jones explains uh, the power of a church that is joyful because of the good news of the gospel. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a a pastor and a preacher in England uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And he has a series on spiritual depression. And he says this, he says, as we face the modern world with all its trouble and turmoil and with all its difficulties and sadness, nothing is more important than that we who call ourselves Christian, those of us who claim the name of Christ, should be representing our faith in such a way before others as to give them the impression that here in Christ is the solution. Here is the answer. In a world where everything has gone so sadly astray, we should be standing out as men and women apart. People characterized by fundamental joy and certainty in spite of conditions, in spite of adversity. Now, he spoke that in 1960-something, and things have not changed very much. Nor, they haven't changed for the world And they certainly haven't changed in the truth of the church being the source of joy, the the picture of joy, that that we do have the solution. It is uh, sometimes seen as exclusive and it's a little bit uh, arrogant, you might hear, to say that you have the solution to all of life's problems. But the gospel, the good news of a Savior who has come to give us joy and to give us a hope, it really is the solution. But how do we do it? How how do we offer a solution to a world? Sometimes even for some of you in this room, it's a battle just to get out of bed. I recognize that. The, The state of loneliness in our nation right now is at epidemic levels. I mean, people are lonely everywhere. Depression, anxiety. In fact, it's so bad that the Department of Health and Human Services released a report last year about the state of loneliness and isolation post-COVID. That the study showed that even before COVID, people were isolated, they were lonely, which is ironic because we live in an age where we can talk to anybody, see anybody, post anything, read anything, connect with anyone quicker, faster, more broadly than at any point in history. And yet we are the most lonely people on the planet. Americans are the most lonely people on the planet. Christians in the American church in the the West are some of the most lonely people. Why? Why is that? Why is it that people feel so alone, but yet they're surrounded by many people? The answer lies in our text this morning where there is one who has come. It's a spiritual issue. It's not, a, it's not an issue that you can deal with by you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's money can't solve it. Um, busyness can't solve it. Uh, distraction can't solve it. it. This is a spiritual issue. And there's one who has come to give us a spiritual answer. To, to actually, in fact, conquer our hearts. To conquer loneliness. To conquer Morning to conquer all those things that leave us in despair. 
Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, is known as the fifth sermon song. The center of Isaiah is mostly a focus on the suffering servant who would come and who would bear the iniquities of those who needed the atonement of their sins. But then towards the end of the book, there's this promise of the conqueror who will come, the king, the servant, the one who would conquer the world and would bring joy and restoration to God's people. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 is actually a continuation of what the prophet has been forecasting from the very beginning. If you, if you turn with me really quickly, you'll see this uh, in 11, chapter 11, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where uh, the Spirit is promised to be upon the one who would come. A shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, he says, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's the Davidic line, the king that was promised. And then it is promised that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. He will have a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength. He will have a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, we read the same thing. This is my servant, the Lord says. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. And I have what? I have put my spirit on him. In chapter 48, verse 16, the promise again is that the spirit would be on him. Approach me and listen to this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time anything existed, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. The best expositor of all of scripture in all of history shows us clearly, tells us clearly exactly what this text means. Turn with me really quickly to Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in a synagogue and he's in Nazareth, his hometown. He goes back there. And Luke records that, as usual, he goes into the synagogue where they would exposit the scripture and then they would open it up for a time for people to share. And Jesus, as usual, enters the synagogue. He's on the Sabbath day. That's when they would gather together and the men would listen to the word read. And then they would pontificate on it. They would give opinion and they would give thoughts on it. One would teach on a particular passage and at this point Jesus is given the opportunity whether he requested it or somebody looked at him or he just said it. It doesn't say but it says that the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and unscrolling the scroll, unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. He turned to Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus then rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant, and he looks at them. He says, today, in your hearing, as we speak, this prophecy has been fulfilled. It's done. You're, You're in real time seeing Isaiah... 800 years ago, spoke of what you are in this synagogue experiencing right now. The fulfillment of this prophecy, this promise, the one who he was talking about is here. It's fulfilled. In many ways, actually in exactly the same way, for those of you sitting here listening to this word right now, the Spirit of the Lord is upon the word of the Lord, and this is being fulfilled in your hearing right now. Literally, I'm not being hyperbolic here. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the Christian church, those of us who believe, this church that believes that the word of God is the very word of God, it is not my words that you're listening to. You're listening to the words of Jesus. It is as if Jesus himself is speaking to you right now when we read this text, and he is saying, this has been and is being fulfilled. Little, little weightiness there, isn't it? So, so what is my responsibility? My responsibility is not to like put my opinion on what Jesus should have said or didn't say. M- my role is to make it, make it clear to you what, what the implications are of those words. So this is a pretty easy and straightforward text. When Jesus says, hey, 
I'm going to tell you what this is about. That's okay. Well, let, let's just let's just go with that. That sounds good to me. So uh, let's work through the text briefly, and, and then I want to look at three implications, three things that are very clear in this passage that we have to wrestle with. You, you're going to have to walk out of those doors and come to some conclusion about whether or not you believe it to be true or not, because there's some implications for us, for both those of you who believe. And for those of you who have yet to believe that Jesus really is the conqueror of all of the world, the Lord and Savior, that the Spirit of God was really upon him. First, uh, for those of you who like to take outlines, here it is, three things. One, this is the conqueror speaking. This is the Messiah's Jubilee, the anointed one. He is the conqueror promised, and so the conqueror has a call and a commission. So we're going to look at first, Christ the conqueror, his call and his commission. Two, his task, his task was to preach, it was to heal, and it was to deliver. And thirdly, the conqueror's people, they are righteous trees. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the task. Let's look at the commission. First, uh, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. That is, that is a first person speaking there. He is uh, the one who was promised. Isaiah, you can tell when he writes, you can tell when Isaiah is writing, and he goes back, and in fact, pretty common in prophetic literature, you see the back and forth. This is God speaking. This is the Messiah speaking. This is Isaiah speaking. This is other people speaking. Here it is first person. This is the Messiah. How do we know that? Well, because he is anointed. That's where Messiah comes from, the anointed one. That's where we get the Greek word Christ. You are christened, anointed. You are the one upon which the Spirit is going to use to save the people. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me. Why? Well, because the Lord has anointed me. The Lord God, Yahweh, has said, you are the one on which I'm going to put my spirit. And what is he going to do? He has a task. In context, the task is to bring the Israelites out of exile, out of Babylon, back to Zion. Jerusalem is the seat of the people of uh, God where they worshipped him. The temple was there, but it's been destroyed. In fact, the promise of their return is the thing that gives them hope. But when they get back there, you read in Ezra and Nehemiah, they are in despair because they look around and everything is in ruins. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me, he says, because the Lord has anointed me. To what? Now we have his task. To bring good news to the poor. He is being called out by God. So point number one, fairly quick. The call of God is on this Messiah, and he's being commissioned. He's giving a task. The great commission, you've heard that? Jesus gives his disciples a commission. When you get a commission from a city, if you're commissioned to do an artwork, you are tasked with doing something. And so here is the call and the commission of the Messiah. What is he supposed to do? What is his task? Point number two. Uh, the Lord has anointed me to... Bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. The task that this Messiah was given was to proclaim, to speak, to preach, to teach. He was to bind, to heal. He was, he was to deliver. If you follow along in the rest of the passage, you'll see that in verse 4, that these righteous trees, these righteous trees that are planted intentionally by the Lord, to glorify him, they are going to what? They are going to rebuild. They're going to restore. They're going to worship. And they're going to call other people to worship. They will speak of you, in verse 6, as priests. You will be called priests, and they will speak of you as ministers of our God. They're going to not only worship, but they're going to call others to worship. That was Ezra and Nehemiah's job. The, the, 
the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about the Israelites return back home and the rebuilding and the, re, the, the they found the law again, they taught the law, and they were absolutely floored by what they didn't know. And so they had to rebuild their worship practices. In verse 7, you'll see that they're going to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Not their labor, but the Messiah's labor. He has done the work to conquer. He's done the work to to restore them, and, and he is going to give them everything to enjoy. We talked about that last week, that Zion is the picture of a, of a blessed city, the people of God that are going to have wealth beyond compare. That's whose work? Is it their work? No, it's, it's, it's the Messiah's work. And then in verse 10, the Messiah himself, verse 10, he is going to rejoice. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. It goes back to the one speaking. He is speaking about what he will come to do and what he has been commissioned to do and what his task is. So when we ask the question, so, okay, who has God sent? God has sent the conqueror. He sent the warrior. He sent a savior, a Messiah. To whom has he sent? He sent it to people who are poor. Let's look through this list. He sent them to bring good news to the poor. That word there, poor, is people that have no opportunity to give anything else. They have been taken advantage of. They have been uh, um, been uh, exploited. The problem with the, the Israelites was that their priests, their kings, their ministers were taking advantage of the poor. They were robbing them for all that they were worth. They were building their wealth on the backs of these people whom they should have been caring for. They are in need of charity. And so the task is to bring good news, to bring a gospel to the poor. He sent to heal. There are brokenhearted people. That word brokenhearted there, those are people who have no direction. They're hopeless. They're brokenhearted. Have you ever run into somebody who is brokenhearted? Mostly teenage boys who, you know, have a crush on a girl. And uh, they wrote it. Well, we used to write notes. Does anybody remember, do you like me, yes, no, maybe, circle one? The safest bet was maybe, but then, you know. Uh, brokenhearted and a little bit more serious uh, weight for those who have been married for a long time. Uh, one of my favorite uh, movies is Up. You yeah, remember Up in the beginning scene of Disney's Up where this couple, this old couple, they grow old together and they find out they can't have children together. And so they travel and they love and then she... Uh, dies and he is broken hearted. He is directionless. He just wants to give up his heart, his, his seat of direction. That's what the heart was, was the orientation. It no longer wanted to move forward. It just was broken. These people are broken hearted because they don't know what their future holds. God has forgotten them, which he has promised through Isaiah. It's like, I've not forgotten you. In fact, I'm restoring you. And I'm going to send one who will, who will heal your broken heart. He's to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. That word captive there is someone who is bound. The word prisoner is someone who's judicially locked up. How are captives released? Well, captives, you basically have to subdue the one who has tied them up, who has bound them up. Like Samson, if you're familiar with Samson and Delilah, he was bound up. It's that same word. They are tied. They are captive. They are bound. Prisoners who are locked up in jail for their own crimes. He's going to proclaim to them the year of the Lord's favor. And this is where Jesus stops. In Luke, Jesus takes the scroll and he doesn't go any further than this. He stops at the year of the Lord's favor. What is the year of the Lord's favor? Well, what it is, it's a reference back to the Levitical law where Israel was supposed to have a year of seven. And on the seventh year, uh, they would rejoice. They'd take a year off. Could you imagine working six years and then, hey, we'll see you in another year, guys. Have fun. Enjoy. How many of you would like to work for a company that said, tell you what, we're going to give you the seventh year off, fully paid? Yeah, I, I see that hand. Some of you are like, nah, I want to I work every single day of my life. Well, then every seven years, you'd have a year off. And then on the 49th year, be like, hey, guys, the 50th year, Dude, we are, this is, we're going to do something extra special here. The 50th year is a year of jubilee. Come on now, let's give praise to the Lord. Because why? He's going to restore everything that you lost. For those of us, and I mean this, who have the privilege of having a mortgage, 
it's true. Some of us don't have a mortgage. You want to own a home, right? So, but the privilege of having a mortgage is you own a home, but you get what every month, digitally or in the mail. Hey, just wanted to check in with you, says Penny Mac. You owe us this month this amount of money. All right, just look at that little amount that your monthly payments, like I, if you pay this, you own your home. Don't look at the interest that is accruing that you're going to pay triple what you bought for the house. For those of you who don't own a home, maybe you have a relative and maybe they live in a nice home. Wouldn't you like to kind of think about living? You Like they've got a pool, like I would love to live there. But what if they just gifted it to me? Wouldn't that be great? Sometimes I daydream about like, you know, what if somebody gifted me like an incredible, who do I, what do I need to do? Here's the, here's the year of Jubilee. Imagine if I told you, you have 60 minutes. You have 60 minutes. Go get your mortgage bill, bring it back here, and it'll get paid. It'll get paid. No questions asked. Just bring me your bill. How, how do you feel right now? Well, one, some of you will be like, well, I know this is an illustration, right? So... I know that Tom is not going to pay, but just imagine, that's one of the questions. Do I have the capacity to pay that bill? How much financial freedom would you have if your bill was paid off? What would you do with it? What would you do? If I gave you a home and I said it's fully paid for, how would you feel? You see, in Israel, it was a time of fresh starts. If you made a poor mistake and you lent yourself out to another Israelite and you had to work off your debt for 47 years... On that 50th year, you got back everything that you lost, and your family started over. And for those who owned it, they got back what they were originally started at. You see, it was a a restoration of all things. It was a freedom, and Israel was supposed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor all year. So if you were an Israelite living in the hills and you lost track of, of, of time, which would be impossible for them because they would constantly get together. But someone would go to them and say, hey, it's the year of Jubilee. They're like, what? Yeah, what are you doing out here? You're rich uncle. You own that land outside of Jerusalem. Come on. The year of Jubilee, fresh start, forgiveness of your debt, restoration of all the things that you've lost. They never celebrated it ever, nor did they celebrate the every seven years. There's no record of them ever celebrating what God said, this is what I want you to do. Jesus comes along and he, in real time, turns to this passage and he stops at verse 2 to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The day of grace. His, His task was to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it is a reference to all of the things that are, are broken. All of the financial transactions that you made a mistake and you lost everything. All of the things that you're bound to because you can't get yourself out of debt. All of the mistakes that you have made where you just can't seem to dig yourself out of the hole. I'm going to bring you up out of the pit. I'm going to give you back what you don't deserve. I'm going to cancel your debt because it is the Lord's day of favor. I don't know if you've seen, but the Powerball is at up to one billion dollars. Some of you already know this. We were—I was passing by the billboards, and it was like I, we we drove up the turnpike, and it was nine hundred ninety-nine million on Friday. On Saturday, it was one billion dollars. One billion. It's a lot of money. Uh, I know none of you do this, but sometimes I'm like, what would I do with $1 billion? What would I do? What would you do with $1 billion? How generous would you be? Would you have room to be generous? You see, the call and the commission of the Messiah was to be sent with a task, not to, not to gain for himself, but to give of himself. To give back what was not deserved, to clear the debt, to, to bring forgiveness, to, to, to bind the broken heart. And, and the interesting uh, thing about this language is if you look at he is to heal the brokenhearted, to, to bind. What do your kids have to do 
when they cut their knee and they come in screaming and crying, what do they have to do? They have to submit to mom or dad. They have to sit on their lap. They have to, they have to allow you to clean the wound. They have to allow you to bind. You, you have to submit yourself to a doctor when you need healing. We have to submit ourselves. That word there is to bind. You, you aren't bound or healed unless you decide that you want to be healed. Jesus, if you remember, he passes by a man who has been an invalid for a long time. And what, what does Jesus ask him? He says, do you want to be healed? Do you, do you, is this something that you want? In the same way, Jesus is asking now, do you want to be healed? Do you want your heart mended? Do you want your impoverished spirit the weight of the guilt of your sin. Do you want that lifted? Do you want that? Do you want to be free? Do you want liberty to be who you were created to be? Do you want that? Some of us don't want that. Many people in Israel didn't want that. The Pharisees didn't want that. Many people that were alive in Jesus' day, it's interesting because Jesus doesn't go around healing everybody instantly. In fact, the reason why he doesn't give his church the power to heal instantly all the time is because if we did that, what need would we have of God, right? If we had an abundance of wealth, an abundance of health, and nothing was wrong, and there was no suffering, no, what would happen to us? We would just become self-sufficient, and we would no longer turn to our creator. We would no longer feel the weight of the brokenness of this world, the, the sin, the captivity. Who are we in captivity to? We are in captivity to the one who bound us from the very beginning when we believed the lie that God was not good enough. Did God really say, Satan tells Adam and Eve? And in that moment, when they believed him and not God, they were bound and they were held captive. In fact, to open the eyes of the blind is another translation here. It it is, in fact, not just necessarily a coming out of prison. It is a coming out of prison where you have been in the dungeon for so long that the sun is bright and your eyes are open and you're squinting and you're like, ah. It's like driving down Westchester Pike, which is very dangerous in the morning from Westchester here because the sun is right. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or in the evening when you're going out, the sun has decided to plant itself right in the center of Westchester Pike, either going east or west. And you can't see any cars, and you're driving by faith, which I would not suggest. Some of you are living by faith in the wrong way, where you think that you have it all together. You are, you, you just, you, your eyes have not yet adjusted to the reality that you are completely bankrupt, and you can't stand before holy God and present to him anything of which of any value will get you out of your captivity. You think that you have it all together, but you remain impoverished. You remain captive. You remain bound. You are not free. None of us are free. We can't unbind ourselves. That's what Jesus came to make us see, is that you are captive to sin. And yet Jesus comes with scissors, and he just cuts that rope off of your arms. He kicks open the door of the prison. He gently opens your eyes to see the gravity and the weight of your sin, but more so he wants you to see his love and his kindness and his compassion and his his mercy on you. Man, that's, that's something to be joyful about. He has paid your mortgage and then some. He has given you a bank account to purchase a house you could not afford ever. He has freed you from the verdict of guiltiness before a holy God. This is his call. This was what he was commissioned to do. And now, what are the people of God, the righteous trees, the the ones who are going to be crowned with beauty instead of mourning? In verse 3, it says that he has come to provide for those who mourn in Zion. If you were here last week, you you know that Zion is the future picture of the church. Friends, there are some of you who are mourning this morning, and you think that it is without purpose, but it, it, it has a purpose. There is sadness and sorrow this side of eternity in the church. Friend, if you are struggling with depression, anxiety, 
if there's something going on with your body that you just can't get a hold of, but, and you think you're a lesser Christian because you just can't get yourself out, out of bed in the morning, th- it is not so that you are not favored by God. It is just that your body is broken. You are loved by God no matter how much you feel it or not. And the promises of God are that you can find comfort in the fact that your joy may not be at its fullest right now, but it will be on that day when you will, and we will celebrate this, you will see the Lord face to face, you will see his resurrected body, and you yourself will be resurrected. You will no longer struggle with depression, or fear, or anxiety, or poverty, or sadness, or sorrow, or depression feeling unloved. There's no more barrier. It will be all lifted. But that is the hope of the gospel, the promise that we are to proclaim that those who are mourning in Zion, these are the holy ones who are mourning in Zion. These people, these Israelites, they go back to Zion and they're like, holy crap, my my house is in rubbles. I was coming back. I've been, I've spent a whole generation in Babylon. And now we're being sent back by Cyrus, the Persians. And now we have to rebuild what is broken. It says that they went to the walls and the older people wept because they realized that Jerusalem was just absolutely sacked. But rather than give up, what they say is like, let's, re- let's rebuild this sucker. Let's do it. And they worked. And they rebuilt. And the promise was that God was going to rebuild the city, only it wasn't a physical city. It was a spiritual city. He was going to rebuild something more than they could ever hope or imagine. It wasn't just about walls in Jerusalem. It was about every tongue, tribe, and nation hearing the good news of a Savior, of a King. And the trees of righteousness, those who are bound up, they will be called, in verse 3, they will be called. These people, the ones that God comes, He sends the Messiah to come, these ones who have been lifted up out of the prison of their sorrow and sadness, those who have been forgiven, those who have been comforted, those who have been listening to the good news, they will be called righteous trees. And if you remember our study in Psalms, blessed is the one who lives by, plants planted by streams of living water. They will become a tree that bears its fruit in every season. A tree, you will be a tree that bears good fruit. You will be a righteous tree, which means that you are expected to bear fruit in season. These are disciples of Jesus. How do I know that? Because Jesus said this text is about him. God's people will be righteous trees. They will bear fruit. They will be rooted. They will grow. They will be strong. What does this mean for us? It's very simple. You ready? One, friends, find comfort and joy in God's faithfulness. God promised in 789 BC, and he fulfilled it in 33 AD, and he will fulfill it in the future. He fulfills fulfills his promises. All of these have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God was faithful to his promise. So find comfort and joy that God does not break his promises. If he says he's going to raise you from the dead, he will raise you from the dead. How do I know? Jesus was dead. He was buried and he was alive now and ascended to the Father. That's good news. You're not always going to look as ugly as you are right now, Andrew. Just kidding. I don't, why do I got to pick on you? Because you're right there. Find comfort and joy in the faithfulness of God. He sent Jesus, he will send him again too. There is much clarity in our call. Christ's call and commission was very clear. We are the body of Christ. We have the same call and commission to do the same thing. You cannot just coast being the body of Christ. We must be the body of Christ in this world. Our call and commission is the same. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. That's what Pentecost was. The Spirit, you are the body of Christ. Therefore, you are Christ in this world, and the Spirit anointed you to do the work that Christ was sent to do. And all of us can't do all of it at the the same time. We are gifted in different ways to bring this to the world. 
We are called to be righteous trees. We are called to bear good fruit. And finally, the application. So if, if the call and commission is for us, and we know that God is faithful in his promises, we also need to know that our battle is spiritual. This is a spiritual battle. The spirit of the Lord is on me. And therefore, we as a church must do the same thing that the Messiah did. We must battle. We must conquer spiritually. So how do we do that? It's really easy. Three things, right? Right here it is. Intercessory prayer. We pray. We beg God for each other and for the lost in this world. We pray. Intercessory prayers, going before the Father and begging for men, women, and children who do not yet know Christ to know Christ. We beg God to intercede for those who we love that are in the church and outside of the church. We pray. We are to be a praying people. Two, we are to be proclaimers of the gospel. That's why God raises up preachers and pastors and evangelists and teachers we must proclaim the gospel. And if you're not paid to preach, and if you aren't necessarily good at, you know, kind of public speaking, at the very least, you are still called to give the reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. We pray for God to give us opportunities to evangelize, to bring good news to other people. That if someone asks you, what it is that you're doing this week and you, and you and you stumble through an awkward answer of like, well, I, I'm a Christian and we kind of do this thing and e- want to come to Easter? <laughs> to God be the glory because you did the best that you could and you took a step of faith. We proclaimed the good news. And finally, it is friendships. Right now, you have, some of you are lonely. You have friends that are absolutely lonely crippled by loneliness. We talk about being a church that is rooted in God's word and gathered around God's table. The invitation to God's table is to be broad. It's to, to, be, to be to anyone. If someone is lonely, you can bring them in. Where else will they find the most life-giving, life-supportive friendship relationship, if not in the church, the body of Christ? Jesus was the greatest friend. I hope to all of us in this room that Jesus is our friend. Uh, is Jesus a close friend of yours? Do you love him? Has the Spirit stirred your heart? Do you remember when Jesus approached you and invited you to be his friend? Well, in the same way, you can do the same thing for people who are absolutely lonely and without hope. And that's the way that we battle. We build friendships. We, We proclaim the gospel and we pray that God would do that. That's how God conquers the world. That's how he conquers his his people. That's how we, the church, conquer for Christ, with Christ, because he is the conqueror. He is the one who has conquered the grave. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. And he has done it by his spirit. And he's done it so that we might have life and life to the fullest. Can Please, can I get an amen? <laughs>